Good morning and welcome for the second week to Fin24 Speaks. My name is Ron Derby, uh, editor of Fin24. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Our guest this morning for the second week is Michael Power of Global Strategies at 91, formerly Investec Asset Management. I mean, last week we spoke about his views on the future of established Western economic powers, with a particular focus on the rise of the East and in particular China in particular. Today we'll talk about realigning South Africa's economy to meet the, with those changes and basically keep South Africa's economy relevant into the next decade and beyond. Uh, now that we're into the uh, 2020s, we've just published Michael's piece on the challenge of realigning our economy as, as such. And good morning, Michael. Thanks. Thank you for, join, for joining us once again. Good morning, Ron. This is becoming regular. Yep, it should be. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great fireside conversation, especially in this cold weather. Michael, uh, before we get into that, so that, that, so I guess that that's a long-term vision, a medium to long-term vision. I mean, on Monday, we, re we reopened the South African economy after two months of what I call a hibernation, a, a necessary one, uh, given the pandemic we faced. J just how much damage has the lockdown done to the, to the economy, you think? And, and over the next half of the year, just how do you see us performing? It's done a lot of damage to that part of the economy that was functioning before. Mm. But let us not think that that is the whole economy. There is a much wider definition of what is the whole economy. And one has to remember that even going into the lockdown, we had 35% unemployment. Yeah. So uh, the point is that many people have focused in on specifically the economy that was functioning and that we're familiar with. But my uh, talk this morning is very much addressed at wake up South Africa. There's a much bigger thing that is defined as our economy and a huge part of it wasn't functioning before. And we have to use this terrible uh, situation as a time to reflect and ask ourselves very deep questions as to what it is that we want this South African economy, and I mean the whole economy, to be, uh, and how can it be? And uh, the questions I'm asking and trying to answer in my latest piece address precisely that, the broader economy, the economy that includes that huge pool of unemployed. What can we do to repair that economy, not just that little part of the economy, not so little, but nevertheless, minor part, of, minority part of the economy that was functioning before. And hobbling, but functioning, but hobbling in truth, given this sort of... Hobbling, indeed. indeed. And getting now, worse. And getting worse in truth, just like we're crashing, a slow car crash. Uh, now for a decade, if not more, the South African economy we're talking about now has, at best, drifted, at worst, been on the steep downward uh, turn. I mean, we were set for a recession this year because of load shedding and the like, and we have more than five years of below 2% growth. Just tell us about this, about COVID-19 and what opportunity does it offer us to take a deep breath and, and realize that we're clearly doing something wrong in managing our economy? Well, first of all, understand the wider context that the broader context in which we operate is going to change as a result of COVID-19, <laughs> and that we can't just repair ourselves to be ourselves in the context of what we think ourselves to be, we have to repair ourselves to be relevant to that changed environment externally. So uh, this presents us with that opportunity uh, to think. Um, and you, I know that we're going to come to the whole issue of South African Airways at some point in this discussion. But this is a, an incredible opportunity to do some really deep thinking rather than running around with sticking plaster trying to repair tears here, breaks there, to actually ask ourselves, what is it that the South African economy should try to be? Mm. Uh, so let's use this time productively uh, in thinking and asking hard questions and not merely going back to the old way of thinking, which, as you clearly said, wasn't really working. At 2% mm. GDP growth, it wasn't working. In fact, South Africa in a global context was receding because the 2% growth wasn't really keeping pay, pace with the depreciation in the currency. So mm. uh, we have to understand that we have to make ourselves or try to make ourselves relevant to the totality in which we exist, a totality that is changing fast. And yeah. the new realities of the world that we're part of um, have to play into our thinking 
as to what we must try to do. Which kind of brings me to that sticky tape and uh, the plaster analogy. The 500 billion rand stimulus injection, to me, it just comes across as something just there to, to tape up a little, uh, the, 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 what, what they can immediately see as perhaps gaping uh, problems in the economy, but nothing that substantively will do anything to the Sarafin economy. What, what well, I, don't, I, I don't argue with the, the 500 billion rand. I mean, one can argue with the size or the direction, you know, sometimes one has to basically put out a fire if there's a fire to be put out. I mean, one can't just sit in isolation and do, as I said, think uh, when yeah. there is a fire raging. One has to do something about the immediate situation. But let not that be seen as being uh, grossed up to being the solution to our problems. It's not. Um, we have to actually stand back and ask ourselves some very hard, uncomfortable questions. Uh, um, and now, whilst all the time, as I say, trying to keep the fire at bay, is a very good time to do it. Now, uh, let me take you back, or take, the, take the, the viewers and I guess the listeners back. I mean, since the mid 80s, if you go as far as back as that, job rich uh, growth has been unattainable target for the South African economy. I don't, yeah. But what has held back the South African economy since as far back as then? People tend to forget that this isn't something that's happened over the past few decades. It's been quite a while that the South African economy has, you know, in a sense, struggled to create uh, enough jobs for the population it has. Well, at the risk of oversimplifying, and it is an oversimplification, it's you know, much more complicated than this, we've essentially put the consumption cart before the production horse. Yeah. And for any economy moving forward, it has to be pulled by that horse, not occasionally pushed. Yeah. So our orientation has been incorrect. We are a developing country. We're not a developed country where, to be honest, I'm not sure whether the horse or the cart is doing the leading, but as a yeah. developing country, the horse has to do the leading. We have to pull the consumption behind us, not just live off debt, which is what that consumption potentially would generate, we have to have production. And with the production, if we can get it going, will come the creation of jobs. Mm. So our entire philosophy has to be put back to front. Put the horse before the cart. Mm. What well, you're describing this is a bit similar, I guess, to the US economy without, of course, its size and scale. And of course, we don't have a reserve currency. So this kind of, it must leave us in a much uh, a more vulnerable space, and especially to the... To the so the crashes and so on that comes with, with, with highly indebted uh, populations. And, and part of the problem is, is that there is buried within the totality of the South Africa that we know, a uh, part of the economy that is quote unquote, and I don't really like the term, first world. Hmm. And people who live in that somehow believe that they can behave like other countries in the first world, not recognizing that actually the totality of South Africa is not first world. It's a developing country. Mm. And the priorities that we as a developing country must put to the front must be those of a developing country, not a developed country. So for those who are comfortable and sitting in the middle, who pretend that they live uh, in the developed world, they should not assume the philosophies of the developed world and think that they're relevant for South Africa as a whole. Mm. As, as we venture further into the terrain, into the makeup of the South African economy, if you were to describe how the South African economy actually works to a person, would, would I say just got off the boat in Durban or just crossed the Limpopo with a buck, buckloads of money? How would you describe the functioning of the South African economy? If you were like, in the most simplistic term, I guess, for the, for the viewers and listeners. What it does broadly is. It digs stuff out of the ground or grows stuff in the ground and it sells it abroad. And with the proceeds of those sales, it affords a lifestyle to a core, not the totality, that is very good. Mm. However, even those sales of minerals and agricultural products, and they're supplemented to some extent by tourism, are not enough to keep South Africa going, even that core going, let alone the totality. And the result is that we have as a nation been going further and further into debt. Our debt to GDP ratios have been rising. 
we live a lot off credit. Mm. Even the economic data as it comes out every month is very much geared towards what's called demand management in economics, the consumption side of the economy. We don't prioritize nearly as much the production side of the economy. Even the US, which I would argue is also heavily demand-led, nevertheless, the most important data point of their month is the non-farm payrolls, which comes out on the first Friday of every month. We don't have that. We have things like um, uh, uh, consumer data, um, uh, that's, uh, you know, how many cars were sold, um, uh, maybe inflation, um, yeah. you know, things like that. They tend to be our priorities. Mm. Our priorities must be geared towards production, mm. job creation, not serving this heart of the South African economy that is consumption rich, but doesn't uh, bring in everybody that lives in South Africa uh, into its into its tent, mm. so we are we're a back to front economy that often results in from countries that are born and raised off the back of mineral production. I can't I can't say that it doesn't, or indeed to a lesser degree, agriculture and possibly even tourism, um, but especially those who are mineral rich, uh, like South Africa has been in the past, and even there, um, our fortunes are starting to fade. Mm. Which brings me, I guess, to uh, something you alluded in your piece, uh, these entrenched interests, right? And have their fear of change, well, I guess it, it, it is this, this grouping, has, has this fear of change uh, held us back somewhat from reimagining and, and, re and just changing uh, the shape of the South African economy? I think so, yes. I, I think there is still buried in the psychology of the ruling elite in South Africa that we're a sort of Southern Hemisphere Tuscany cheaper than Tuscany, but a Southern Hemisphere Tuscany nonetheless, mm. not uh, an expensive Asia. And the reality is, in the world that we're now moving into, we're an expensive Asia. Yeah. And if we want to be relevant in a world that's going to be dominated by Asia, we have to understand the consequences of being an expensive developing country in that context. Mm. I mean, in your piece, you speak about uh, this week, you've listed six big ideas that is to building a South African economy of the next decade to make us importantly, just as you say, more relevant and not to follow the course of, say, Argentina, which, which, which we spoke about last week. Top of that list uh, is the, the fact that is, is wages, right? And, and how we almost have to measure ourselves against uh, ch ch the Chinese, uh, is it a working class wage? That's exactly right. I've been talking about this for um, two decades, to little avail, I must say. But the reality is, is that um, the benchmark that we need to be thinking about for a, a semi-skilled person offering their, their, their work in the South African context, it needs to be in some way related to what a semi-skilled worker uh, who's doing the same, uh, and I say in Guangdong in China, is also offering. We cannot have a situation, which has been the situation, and to some extent still is, where the guy who's earning, who's sweeping the floor uh, at a Port Elizabeth car assembly plant is earning considerably more than the lady in Shenzhen who is assembling iPads. Mm. That like-for-like -like comparison on a global context is not sustainable. Yeah. So we have to understand that, yes, the guy in Port Elizabeth is earning considerably less than the guy who's doing the same job in, in Munich in Bavaria, but that's not the way it works. Increasingly, that's absolutely not the way it works. And it's not just China that realizes this. We're now seeing the likes of Vietnam in electrical uh, electronics assembly or Bangladesh in textile manufacturing, or even, dare I say it, close to home, Ethiopia and Kenya, recognizing that this benchmark is one that they have to get their semi-skilled workforces on the right side of. And if they don't, it's going to be very difficult to leverage themselves into the value-adding hierarchy for assembled goods that are likely to be exported somewhere else um, uh, in the world. And, and, and if we somehow believe that we can survive on digging up minerals or growing stuff or possibly tourism, 
55 million people. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough agricultural capabilities. We don't have enough uh, opportunity to, to sell ourselves in tourism and all of those three combined. You know, Australia probably sells three or four times as many resources as we do and has half the population. So they can, to some extent, get away with it. And I, I'm, 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 I'm saying that with qualification because even they have to work hard in other areas. And geography helps. They become a huge tourist destination before the pandemic for a lot of Asia. Huge number of Chinese students working uh, at universities in Australia. So they've had managed to leverage themselves into essentially the Asian story. Mm. They sell their resources to Asia, they get their tourists from Asia, and they get their students from Asia. They've made themselves relevant in that context. And there's only 25 million of them. Yeah. Um, so they can come up with a different formula. There's 55 million of us. We need to think of our formula in the context of the world, not only of what we are about today, but what is a world that's rapidly changing and will be vastly different within even five years and definitely within 10. So I call this reorientation. And there's obviously a, a double meaning to that word because the Orient is Orient. got to be center, central in that thinking. So I guess just hearing you talk here, like, like there's time for a different sort of negotiation when it comes to unions in South Africa. But I mean, the, our unions are very much short term. Short termism is all about uh, wages of workers now. And the talks with unions ultimately are still very important in the second context, but the conversation needs to re vastly change from the conversations we had over the past 20 odd, 20 odd years when it comes to the union movement, which has, in truth, weakened quite significantly. I, I think that's right. I'm not going to come down on them too hard. First of all, um, it's very difficult, even if it wasn't unions, yeah. uh, to ask anyone to take a cut in wages. So I'm not talking about a cut in rand wages. Ultimately, it's a renminbi price that's important in that wage. My solution or my, my, my possible solution is one which has been employed by all sorts of countries all over the world. And they were no, by no means the first, but by far the most effectively, uh, China. And that is to have special economic zones, export processing zones, zones which are essentially parallel universes that allow you to set a different set of rules, particularly with regards to the price of labor. Mm. The government comes to the party by providing certain services, but at the same time, not taxing anything or anyone in those spaces. And it allows these areas slowly but surely to build up a capability, which ultimately spills across the border and by osmosis, the, uh, the rest of the country suddenly catches on and understands what needs to be done. The most famous example of this is, is, is what happened between Hong Kong uh, and a tiny little fishing village across the border from Hong Kong in the 1950s. It was tiny, some 5,000 people, called Shenzhen. By 1980, there were 80,000 people in Shenzhen. Today, there are 12 and a half million people in Shenzhen, and it is, un in my opinion, unequivocally the most dynamic city in the whole of China. The stock exchange has the best companies in China listed on it, the ones that are most go-ahead, the ones that are likely to you know, redefine the space that we all live in. That started because Hong Kong was the export processing zone for a period of time. Uh, and the people of Shenzhen caught on as to what needed to be done and did it at a, at a lower price. And ultimately, uh, or uh, uh, today, not necessarily a lower price. There are certain wages in Shenzhen for, you know, for, for computer engineers that would be higher than they would be in Hong Kong. Um, so, but nevertheless, the story caught on. Uh, and a city of 12 and a half million people um, arose and very successful. And that was inside, not in the export processing zone, but inside. And we have to understand that we can potentially do the same. So I, I strongly advocate export processing zones, which is exactly what's happening in Ethiopia, which is exactly what's happening in Kenya. I don't know why we don't embrace them with a vengeance here in yeah. South Africa. 
Um, for goods along the coast, because it's really important to be close to a port if yep. you are essentially exporting. But interestingly, there's an example that comes uh, from Latin America, from, from Uruguay, where they set up something called a Zona America, which is a services export processing zone just outside of the capital city, Montevideo. And it's hugely successful. They provide services to all over Latin America. None of those services can be imported into Uruguay. But there's a huge number of people that work in that zone and provide banking, architectural, advertising, uh, all sorts of services, computer services all over Latin America. And it's a very successful model. So it's not just about goods, though unquestionably, I see goods being by far the most important because I think that's going to be the one which will end up potentially employing uh, huge numbers of semi-skilled uh, people here in South Africa. But the government has to come to the party by not coming to the party, mm -hmm. by getting out of the way and by basically letting, and the unions as well, there would be no union representation. Health and safety rules would need to be observed very strictly, but in the export processing zones, essentially it's a free market and you let things happen. And if the unions you know, can't recognize that actually generating jobs for South Africa is uh, the big thing that we all need to do, not just the unions, everybody needs to recognize that, then um, we're going to continue, as you described, on the, uh, for the last 10 years of the gentle decline, which could possibly now accelerate into something a little faster, sa sadly brought on by um, the pandemic. And this would, I mean, these zones would change the game. I remember as a young reporter getting excited by Gokha and the development of Gokha. It would change the game for places like Gokha in the Eastern Cape, which I guess goes to your point about the importance of these uh, coastal towns in, in this country. Absolutely. And, and look, it's ready made and ready to go. Yeah. Um, government needs to understand, though, that having essentially set the health and safety framework, they need to stand back. Mm. They need to encourage foreign investors, not South African companies, to translocate there. This is to bring in new investors and to give them, for a period of time, it can be limited, 15 years, like free reign to get jobs in there and to re-export. What this is part and parcel doing is putting that production uh, horse ahead of the consumption cart. And in the process, perhaps most importantly, generating jobs. Mm -hmm. And this is, and this speaks to, I guess, the manufacturing sector, uh, uh, the biggest jobs multiplier in the country. Just before we move on from here, just how much of a threat, I guess, is automation in the sector, which is uh, is a, which uh, globally? Look, it is a th it yeah. is a threat. Um, and I had a uh, had a fan fan fascinating conversation with a friend of mine in 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 Kenya recently. I was born there, so I have uh, particular connections there. Um, and he says, "Look, we probably see ourselves as having." 15-year lead time on the machines. Mm. So we better get our act together quickly and use this 15 years wisely because there is no doubt. I mean, China is the number one um, installer of industrial robots on the planet by far. And Chinese workers, I'm not sure when you know, they go to ask for a, a wage rise, I think their managers either say to them, machine or Vietnam, because um, that's, that's the reality. They are uh, faced with both. Yeah. I think particularly so, dare I say it, if um, the United States um, pressurizes and leads the West into diversifying its sources supply away from China. Uh, Apple has just given the contract manufacturing job for its new headphones to go with its uh, stuff. Uh, to be made not in China, where most of its stuff has been made up until now, but in Vietnam. So uh, these are these are the realities. That's the nature of competition. Um, we can decide not to play, but then what is it that we do? We just end up, very sadly, because as you know, I very much like the place, hmm. in, a, in a situation rather like Argentina, yeah. which is going through a default as we speak. Um, and uh, you, know, you can't dig up enough out of the ground or grow enough in the ground or get enough tourists in 
to meet the demands that the population has for jobs, for foreign goods, um, and life becomes incredibly tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, going now to, to these changes and, and the relevance of the South African economy, I mean, 400, 400, 480 odd years, you've said it, as you point out in your piece, the West, it's all been, it's been about the West, the world's been dominated by that. Uh, with that end, seemingly now, uh, how important will, will the East really be to us? And how do we ensure our economy is geared towards that Atlantic Ocean and you said the, the, and uh, the Indian, uh, uh, Indian Ocean? Away from the Atlantic Ocean, rather, and towards the Indian, the Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean based. Look, I think that, um, first of all, recognize our geography. Where are we? Well, we do have an Indian Ocean on our coast, though the mentality of some people who live in Durban is that the water offshore is actually part of the Atlantic Ocean. It's not, mm -hmm. it's the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and we're already a member of the club, um, but we just haven't taken um, up our rights as a member uh, to anything like, for instance, the Kenyans, or by extension, the Ethiopians, which is Ethiopia now is technically a landlocked country, but nevertheless see, see themselves as part of the Indian Ocean Basin and start to um, capitalize uh, on geography. So first of all, recognize where we are. We do have an Indian Ocean face. And I mention Indian Ocean because it's incredibly important we understand that it's not all about China. Although yeah. China is going to be super central to global thinking over the next decade and beyond, the Indian Ocean basin in itself is also potentially a huge opportunity for us as South Africans. Um, there are a lot of people, two billion people, living around the Indian Ocean, obviously led by the Indian subcontinent. But we have a, a much closer cultural affinity. It's not just because we play cricket, for instance, um, to the Indian uh, um, subcontinent. Mm -hmm. uh, Australia is on one side. Um, uh, Indonesia, which many people here in Cape Town understand played a huge part in our, our cultural origins. Um, you know, the Cape Malay is actually Cape, Cape Indonesia. Um, so we have that connection. Um, we have connection uh, to uh, the East African coast. Um, and so I think we need to understand that the way that we play the Asian story is through the Indian Ocean Basin. That's going to be our right to be a member of the club. Yeah. And we must understand that. We have good geography in that regard because um, we are a member of that club, but we also, um, and it's not as if the West is going to disappear overnight, um, have very good sea connections to the West. So we play our position to our advantage. Mm. Um, and uh, we play it through... Um, being a member of the Indian Ocean Club. Political alliances uh, such as BRICS, where we kind of really squeezed our way onto that list. And of course, it's quite <laughs> perfect that we are the, the, the last uh, S there on BRICS. Is it, is it a useful alliance in the future, despite, I guess, the madness of Brazil's leader? No, not mm. really. It was a convenient, I mean, it was an acronym that worked for about five years in the investment world. Uh, much more uh, interesting would be uh, a group that was centered on everybody who borders the Indian Ocean. That would be a much more powerful club. Mm. Um, and I really could see that. You know, to some extent, dare I say it, and I, I'm, I'm provoking a response here, uh, <laughs> a club that would not have to include China. Mm. Um, and that would be a very interesting club to be a member of. Um, and I think has has a dynamism, has a has a potentiality um, that, that that we could really uh, make a very good contribution towards. Not involve China, why? Well, China's not a member of the uh, doesn't border the Indian Ocean. I mean, it's um, yeah, it's just you know, it's, yeah. it's just a sort of uh, you know fact of geography. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't mean specifically to exclude China, but sometimes. Um, uh, when there's a whale in the bath, there's not much room for the other fish to swim around. Uh, that's true. <laughs> that's very true. I don't know. Speaking of uh, moving, moving on to the to back to the South African economy, uh, I'm speaking to the, the, the South African Reserve Bank governor later this morning. And I'm sure he'll be interested in, in what you have to say 
about the supportive role the bank should play in, in the country. I mean, historically, you've never been a supporter of inflation targets. I think it was introduced at, uh, towards, towards the end of the 90s. Are you still skeptical about it today? And so what's your view of the, of the mandate to preserve bank? Look, I think everybody in the world who's thinking hard about the concept of inflation targeting at the moment, whether they may have been a supporter of it in, in the past or not, realizes that the environment that the world is part of today, broadly speaking, doesn't require active inflation targeting. If anything, and speak to the ECB or the Bank of Japan in this regard, their inflation targeting amounts to trying to keep prices up, not down. Yep. Mm. Um, and I don't think that was the original intention of the New Zealand um, uh, Central Bank when it set up inflation targeting back in the 1980s. Um, and any other bank that's employed it ever since, central bank that's employed it since, the idea was to keep prices down. Yeah. Now we are faced potentially with what's called disinflation, but possibly even outright deflation uh, in quite a considerable number of parts of the world. And that creates a whole different operating environment. So whether I liked it or not over the last 20 years, to some extent, has been superseded by events. Yep. Um, we now recognize that the environment in which we're part of is actually not one that highly prizes inflation targeting. Investors who look at countries today do not give them uh, high marks um, because they are following uh, inflation targeting. It's no longer regarded as a sort of a, a badge of honor. Mm. Much more important is understanding how that monetary authority is working within the context of the world that we're now part of. Uh, and that's complicated. Uh, and it, it's different. I don't say there's a, there's a, a universal um, approach that everybody needs to follow. Everyone should uh, essentially create a, an appropriate response that works for them. However, in all of this time, the countries that, broadly speaking, have done well since going back to your original time frame, eight, the 1980s, have been those that have not had benign neglect towards the competitiveness of their currency. Asia, throughout this period, has understood that the competitiveness of their currency is part of what they should be achieving in terms of their monetary objectives. We've had benign neglect towards that subject, and I don't think we can afford it any longer. However, lucky for us, though not necessarily the route by which we got here, we're now in a position where, going back to an earlier comment, the remnimbi price of labor for semi-skilled worker in South Africa is much closer to the prevailing rate in much of Asia. We have essentially not seen our wages in Remnimbi rise very much over that 20, 30 year period. Um, meanwhile, wages in Asia have risen and the gap has narrowed. Yeah. We now have to make sure that we close the gap, bridge the gap. And that's where export processing zones come into the equation. My belief now is that while I don't want the Reserve Bank ever to think that it doesn't have to try and keep inflation under control, no one would say that, mm. but they also need to understand that in the interests of promoting growth in South Africa, which is part and parcel of their constitutional mandate, the competitiveness of the currency is, 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 is a high consideration. And if there was to be another bonanza in commodity prices, the RAND as what's called a commodity currency is threatened potentially with appreciation. And that would not do us for the huge numbers of people that are unemployed or on the edge of being employed in South Africa, that would do them no favors because suddenly that RAND price of labor for the unskilled worker, exactly, yeah. would widen again. So, my uh, belief is that one of the things that the Reserve Bank needs to be fully aware of, as indeed almost every Reserve Bank in the world today is aware of, explicitly or implicitly, is the competitiveness of their currency for the industries in their country that export 
goods and services. It's a, 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 to a favorite topic of mine. Always, always love talking about the mining sector, particularly gold. But I think gold output peaked in 1971, as far back as then. It is not a sunset industry, but you highlighting it here as something to work on reviving South Africa's gold sector. How? Well, uh, let me tell you a little story. I was reading. I was reading a, a piece of history. Always a good place to start when you're talking about these subjects. And in the early 1840s, going back a long way, the American economy not only had stalled, but was going backwards, was actually um, really doing very badly. Mm. And then in 1848, gold was color, uh, discovered in California. And that gave the American economy the push that it needed mm. to reignite its growth path, which it did very successfully, as we know. Although it had to go through a civil war some 15 years later, um, uh, beyond that, uh, the sky was the limit. Um, indeed, connecting east to west in the United States, which became an imperative as a result of the California gold rush, was part and parcel of that ultimate success. I'm saying for South Africa that we've fallen from first to ninth uh, in 20 years in terms of uh, being a global gold producer. We're now number two in Africa after Ghana. Yet we still have the second highest level of gold reserves uh, in the world, in the ground. And that's mm -hmm. the current prices. It could go up if prices were to rise. What I'm seeing is that the role of gold in the world is likely to have um, a new uh, aspect in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And that is, as people start to realize that Asia is where the growth is, capital is going to migrate out of the old world and into the new. And I suspect most of it is going to find itself in Asia, but not all of it. Some mm. of it's going to be a little nervous. Some of it will want to hedge its bet. Some of it will need a safe house stepping stone, as I call it, mm -hmm. as an intermediate place. And given that the, uh, the world of currencies is going to be uh, very volatile at that particular moment as well, uh, as money is leaving the, the, the old world to go to the new, uh, the West to go to the East, some of that money is going to find its way to gold. And we're seeing that happen as we speak. In fact, we've been seeing it slowly but surely um, over the last five years, mm. that gold has become seen not as a, um, a, a hedge against inflation, yeah. but as a, an intermediate store of value. And I think that uh, we're going to see its role in that regard increase dramatically in the next uh, uh, sort of 20 years. I think that ties back to essentially what was happening when gold originally took off in South Africa. And we're going back to the 1880s, 1890s. Yep. Money was leaving the old world and going to the new. Um, and suddenly some of it found its way into gold. And we yeah. know that the gold standard still existed at the time, so that's the way in which it was measured. But nevertheless, gold had an incredible role to play in South Africa back uh, in the 1880s um, uh, for, a for a couple of decades. Yeah. I think that's that right. is again going to happen now. As we see uh, old world capital starting to migrate to the new world, so gold will be uh, a beneficiary for a period of time, I suspect for quite a long period of time for all sorts of uh, technical reasons. But nevertheless, um, I think it will be, uh, and we're seeing it, central banks in Asia are buying gold. Central banks in the West are selling gold. I mean, I'm, I'm broadly exaggerating, but that's yeah. the essential flow of the last uh, 10 years. Um, and we're, 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 I think gold will have a, 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 another time in the sun. And, and we, as uh, the holder of huge gold reserves in the world, stand to benefit from that. However, I want to raise one quick um, proviso here. Yeah. That were that to happen, we mustn't let our currency run away with itself. Yeah, Again, well, that comes with a strong currency, right? Currency. We don't want what's called the Dutch disease to afflict us. We don't want yeah. the bonanza to destroy the competitiveness of our wages when measured in renminbi or possibly in 20 years um, in Indian rupee. Mm. But we're going to have to at the same time recognize that there is an opportunity here, um, which I think is almost counterintuitive, 
for us to revive um, one sector where we have a world competitive advantage. We do, we do. And lastly, I mean, you alluded to it in, in the, as we began the discussion. We have a Minister of Public Enterprises building up the case for the rescue of SAA, maybe with some consolidation around Conway and the like, excitement there. But you argue that we should perhaps follow an open skies policy to repair and promote South Africa's tour as a, as a tour tourism industry. Explain just how you think an open sky policy is the way to, to like rethink our, our imagining of the of airline industry. Well, Singapore has an open skies policy. Uh, open skies essentially uh, allows anybody who can secure landing rights, who has a, a properly functioning airline that meets with all the health and safety requirements um, to fly to your country. It's not done on a government to government level of a negotiation. Uh, once they've secured those landing slots, uh, they basically come to your country uh, and they bring lots of people when they do. Firstly, I also think that the next two years in the world of aviation is going to be catastrophically difficult for anyone to operate. In. Um, I also talk about what's called the LATAM model. Well, LATAM this last week um, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. You know, Latin America's largest airline following Avianca, its second largest. Uh, it's not going to be an easy time for airlines. Uh, we're seeing Lufthansa negotiating a 5 billion euro, sorry, 9 billion euro bailout with the Germans. Um, uh, the, the North American airlines are all doing the same. The reality is, is the airline business, even before we went into this, was undergoing an assault from what is called the super connectors. And the super connectors are four airlines, broadly speaking, all based in our time zone. They are. Famously, Emirates, Etihad, Qatar, and Turkish. And they have not destroyed, but completely altered the economics of being an airline. And the idea that we should try and launch ourselves, not only in the time of the next two years, but into the space where this, these four airlines are dominant, is absolute madness. Far rather important for us to do is to repair our tourism industry. And for, our, for to do that, we need cheap air tickets into South Africa, not expensive. And I don't know whether you know, but British Airways makes per passenger mile flown before the coronavirus blew up, more money out of its London Cape Town route than it does out of any other route in the world. Serious? I, I, I had no idea about that. Yeah. It was an unbelievable gold mine for wow. them. Mm. If they were starting to be disintermediated by people like myself who were saying, I don't mind traveling via Doha um, if I can get a cheaper flight. Uh, and so what was happening is a lot of people were now starting to do uh, Istanbul or Doha or, or Dubai uh, dog leg. But the reality is we want a situation where if we're going to bring tourists in large numbers back to South Africa, we don't want to have our air routes dominated by expensive ticket prices. Yeah. So for the yeah. next couple of years, we should think very hard. Now is not the time to be launching a new airline. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Even the existing airlines, even the big existing airlines are on, you know, on the edge. Yeah. And we want to try and launch an airline into this environment, which is going to be there probably for another two years, because even after flying is uh, back on, uh, on course, as it were, um, airlines are going to be offering unbelievably attractive ticket prices to get people back into the country. So to. it's going to be tough. This is not the time to be launching a new airline. Far rather break with the tradition of having this uh, image of having your own airline and uh, basically say, no, anybody who wants to fly to South Africa that is IATA compliant and can negotiate the time of a landing slot at our various airports is more than welcome to come. Please come. Please bring lots of tourists when you do. There's another thing that happened as well just before the shutdown took place, and it, yep. it, it was lost. Mm. Qatar Airlines bought 49% of Rwandair, but perhaps more importantly, 60% of the new airport that's just been built outside of Kigali. Wow. They have said that they want to make that their African hub. And they're mm. going to run their operations out of this 
airport, which is geographically much more centrally located in the context of Africa than uh, ORT is. Yeah, it is. We, we're at the bottom, right? Yeah. We're right at the bottom. They want to take on Ethiopian, uh, which is the other player in this space, to some extent Kenya, but they're having a hard time at the moment. But if Qatar was to do that, and there is every you know, inclination they're going to do it, that would be an extraordinarily difficult um, environment for South Africa to relaunch uh, an airline in that context. To take on Qatar when they have a hub uh, in Kigali, in a brand new airport. In a brand new uh, airport. That they own 60% of, plus the, air, the local airline where they own 49%. It's not going to be an easy world yeah. for us to work. Yeah. We'll keep a watch on that on the SAA story. Um, my, my views on it have changed quite dramatically about just how they're going about trying to rescue this thing. Maybe you have a point there about letting open sky policies run the room. But uh, thank you once again for joining me this evening. Uh, I think we should make you a regular. We'll keep inviting you in whenever we have something interesting to say. It's right. I really enjoy these, uh, these engagements. So well, much. it won't be ready for a month or so, but I'm doing a whole thing on the rise of the Indian Ocean Basin, and perhaps we can talk about that uh, in a month's time. Well, glad you would love that. Thank you so much. That was Michael Power, Global Digitals at 91, formerly Investec Asset Management. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron.